Well, good morning, colleagues. Uh, very happy to have you join us today for this session. My name is Kevin Kearns. Uh, I teach in the Graduate School of Public and International Affairs. Uh, and I was particularly pleased and honored to be asked to moderate this session on the benefits of using midterm course evaluations. Um, it's a topic about which I have been enthusiastic, even passionate for many years, uh, because um, even before uh, our OMET colleagues uh, launched a, an initiative to do midterm evaluations uh, through that technology, uh, I had done it in the classroom just with um, uh, my own little survey constructed, and I have found it uh, through the years to be an enormously valuable resource uh, for obtaining feedback in real time from students. Uh, obviously, um, end of term evaluations are valuable, invaluable actually, uh, as well, but the benefits only accrue to the following cohort of students, not those who are currently enrolled in the course. And so doing a, an evaluation early or at midterm in a course provides and can provide uh, enormously valuable feedback on on pedagogy, um, uh, reading assignments, uh, classroom interactions, and many other issues that we will hear about today from uh, a really, really um, uh, wonderful panel. We met earlier in the week. We talked a bit about what each would uh, convey, and I personally am enormously excited to hear more about their own experiences with this. Uh, I will introduce them here. Um, in the order in which uh, they are going to um, appear. Uh, first is Lisa uh, Vatodian. Uh, Lisa is the assessment administrator in the Office of Measurement and Evaluation of Teaching. Um, second is Lori uh, Delali O'Connor. She's an assistant uh, professor in the Center of Ur for Urban Education in our School of Education. Uh, third is uh, Kim Payne. Uh, Kim is a lecturer in the Department of Biological Sciences in the Dietrich School of Arts and Sciences. And not yet with us, but we're hoping he joins soon. There have been some, um, a, a few glitches in joining uh, this morning, is Sachin Vilankar. He's a professor in the Department of Chemical and Petroleum Engineering in the Swanson School of Engineering. Uh, we're also uh, joined by Lorna Kearns, who's a senior consultant in the Teaching Center, and Brittany Galuli. We appreciate her being with us. She's a media um, a, a, a specialist in the Teaching Center, and she'll be providing us with technological support. Uh, each of our speech, we'll, we'll, we'll finish our uh, panel presentations in about 30, 35 minutes, leaving us uh, pretty close to that amount of time for questions and discussions. I'm going to ask that you uh, submit your questions uh, in real time, however, uh, while people are speaking. Um, you can put those in the chat um, uh, uh, box, and we will turn to those after all of our speakers have uh, responded. But I'm, I'm suggesting that you do it in real time. Uh, we noted in this morning's um, uh, keynote address that because there's a little bit of a time lag, um, there was a, a, a little silence after his presentation, uh, and then suddenly a bunch of really good questions appeared. So go ahead and submit them, and uh, we will get to them uh, at the end of our presentations today. So first, I'm going to ask uh, Lisa Vadodian to um, tell us a little bit about the OMET process that has just been developed recently for doing um, midterm evaluations and provide us with a bit of that background. Lisa? Hi, hi. Uh, thank you, Kevin. And thank you for um, everyone who is attending our session today. As Kevin said, my name is Lisa Batodian from the Office of Measurement and Evaluation of Teaching. And today we're going to be talking a lot about the advantages of collecting student feedback midterm and really throughout the term. And there are a lot of faculty here already doing this, and there are many ways to do it. Um, just a few are Qualtrics, uh, the survey tools in Canvas, Top Hat, 
um, just to name a few, and, and people might be using other uh, means as well. So our office offers just another option to collect student feedback midterm. And we started this process only about um, a year ago, fall of 2019. And our surveys are open for one week, about halfway through the term. And there are five questions automatically applied, but instructors do have the option to add custom questions. And this option is open to all instructors teaching full-term classes, and it's by instructor request. And uh, then the results are sent to the instructors the day after the survey is closed. So we try to make this a very, very easy way for faculty to collect student feedback early in the term so they can gauge how things are going so far. And it's really easy to request, and I'm going to post those instructions in the chat. Um, and really, you're just going to your teaching survey dashboard and clicking on a yes, and um, then the survey is automatically activated. Um, there's still time to request for this term. Um, the surveys themselves will open on February 22nd and close the 28th. So you have up until next Thursday, the 18th, to request. And again, I'll post those instructions in the chat along with our email address. I'll be here today to answer any questions, but you can always follow up later um, and email any questions or ask for information to omet at pitt.edu. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. And before we go to our first speaker, I noticed that Sashin is, um, if you can hear me, Sashin, you're uh, uh, attending as an attendee, uh, not a panelist. Uh, so perhaps, uh, Brittany or Lorna, if you could help Sashin get in as a, um, as a panelist, uh, uh, that would be really, really helpful. Thank you. Um, Kevin, so let's now turn to... Kevin, um, Sashin and I have been um, speaking and we realize that he's having difficulty. Um, Brittany, I've sent you an email with his phone number. We're going to try to help him. Thanks. Great. Great. Thank you very much. So uh, Lori uh, Delali O'Connor is again assistant professor in the Center for Urban Education in, the, um, in our School of Education. Lori, thanks very much for being with us today. I'm really excited to hear what you have to say about midterm evaluations. Wonderful. Thank you, Kevin, and good morning to everyone and on the panel and in the audience. Um, delighted to be here with you today and just sharing this time and some of my experiences with um, midterm surveys. So as Kevin mentioned, I am faculty at the School of Education, but I think it's important to note that um, before that, I was an evaluator. But even before that and before graduate school, I was a high school social studies teacher. And I think a lot of my pedagogies and practices really um, build from and have learned from that time in the classroom working with ninth grade students. And so some of what I'll say actually connects from that time. Um, but I have used midterm surveys um, from the time that I started teaching here um, at the University of Pittsburgh about five and a half years ago. And so I primarily teach um, graduate students, both in our PhD program and in our EDD program. So these are folks that are engaged in getting research degrees and professional degrees. And I really see them um, as I encourage everyone to see their students as colleagues, right? Not just future colleagues, but current colleagues and co-learners. And that is part of what my um, interest and commitment to sort of getting feedback from them throughout the term is really connected to. So as part of all the courses that I teach, um, we use a or draw from a, a set of community norms. And one of those norms um, is that, you know, nobody knows everything, but together we know a lot. And I find that midterm surveys really connect into that. And so my, my surveys are pretty simple. Um, at the very beginning, I actually just use note cards. And again, maybe that's the high school teacher in me, but it would be a note card that was anonymous and you would respond to three things, right? It was a, a plus sign, uh, a minus sign, and a delta. So what's positive, what's working for you? Um, what's not so great um, or what's not working for you? And what would you like to see changed? Um, and so that was always a really great way just to find out um, in real time how things were working and what could potentially be changed. 
Now, um, in the most recent iteration, I've moved to um, using Qualtrics to do the same thing. And so usually midway through the term, I will ask those questions. And I may build on some additional ones, um, usually very, very um, simple questions that are connected to either the content of the course or the context, right? So we're online right now, um, and all of the courses that I'm teaching have, have um, been online. And so some of that has been responding to that context, right? So thinking about how um, COVID has been impacting my students and their experiences, but also just what the online environment is, you know, how it's impacting learning. And so those are the three questions that I really focus on. Um, and what I ultimately try to do with the responses to those um, three questions and any and any additional is look at them, um, sort of compile them. I'm a qualitative researcher, um, and so I do a lot of coding. So how are these things connected to each other? Um, and what, what general themes am I seeing? And then I try to bring it back the very next class so that I'm able to say to the students, okay, here's what I heard from you. Um, here are some common themes. Here's some things you're going to see me change um, in response to your, you know, to, to the requests you've made, to the needs um, that you that you've surfaced, or just sort of the suggestions you have. Um, I'm fortunate also to often have educators um, in my classroom, and so some of them have wonderful suggestions like, hey, I see what you were trying to do with this activity. Have you thought about this? Um, and so I'm always quick to let them know what is going to be changed as a result um, of the of their survey responses. I also try to be very um, transparent about what may not be able to change, at least in real time. Um, and if that's the case, I, I will let them know why, and we'll talk about other adjustments that we may be able to make. Um, so that I always try to, again, uh, maintain an atmosphere of transparency in terms of what's going on and in terms of as close to real-time feedback as possible. I also draw from prior uh, surveys, both midterm and end of course, to let students know, hey, you know that neat thing we do in class or the thing that you really like? I actually got that from, you know, your colleagues and peers in the last iteration of this class or in a different class. Um, and so those are some of the things I try to do. In terms of motivation, as I mentioned, one of the things is just because um, the midterm survey and the real-time feedback connects with this idea of building a collaborative community, um, of cultivating an ethic of care in the classroom, which I think is supremely important when you're in this online space especially, um, because it is harder to demonstrate care in, in ways we might do in person, um, and to let students know how much you do see them as co-learners and co-collaborators. We often talk about co-conspirators um, in the School of Education, but that this allows them to be part of that process throughout especially when you have um, students who themselves are going to go on to instruct, um, which many many of them are in various ways, it also helps give them ideas. I have heard from many students that that action made them think, oh, hey, I should survey the, the class that I'm TAing right now, or I should think about asking my lab questions like this, because then we can create um, a more collaborative atmosphere, we can create a more collegial atmosphere. Um, and so a, a lot of what I do around midterm surveys is really connected to that. Um, I'm looking forward to answering any questions, but I want to turn it back to Kevin, because I know other folks have wonderful things to contribute as well. Thanks so much, Lori. I'm just always so impressed to hear you talk about creating this community of learning in your classroom and, and practicing a, as a professional educator your own best practices. And the idea of coding for themes and providing feedback, just really terrific uh, practical advice on this that we can come back to uh, in the discussion. So let me now uh, turn to Kim. Uh, Kim Payne is a lecturer in the Department of Biological Sciences in our Dietrich School of Arts and Sciences. And Kim also has some terrific ideas that uh, we talked a little bit about earlier this week, and I'm anxious to hear more about this morning. Kim? Thanks for the introduction. Uh, I am indeed a lecturer in the Department of Biological Sciences, mm -hmm. though it's almost a bit of a misnomer because at this point, I solely teach laboratory courses which has been just delightful to try and translate to an online format for this past year. 
and a lot of that has been something that none of us know where to start. I get ideas from my colleagues, but I am more than willing to accept ideas from my students, and that comes into this idea of seeking that kind of feedback. I would totally echo a lot of what Lori said, especially in terms of getting that collaborative community feeling going. And so I'm not going to labor that, but just to know, to have your students know that you really do value their opinion. And especially if you're doing midterm course surveys, if you're asking them what they think in the middle of the term, that's empowering to them because that can have a direct impact on their circumstances like in the immediate term as opposed to trying to get them interested in providing some good feedback for future terms like you know save someone in the future from this and that is also where like Lori said bringing up concrete examples of where information from students in the past has led to a change, especially a change that you know your students like. It's fun to bring up to my students, for example, uh, yeah, we used to have departmental final exams for this lab class. And after a lot of student feedback and thought, you know, we decided to change it and shift it. To, so yeah, there are big changes and small changes that can come as a result of your input. Uh, before the midterm course surveys were available by OMET, I would frequently do my own surveys, though I've really embraced the tech side of things now that we are so online, and I like conducting Google surveys, though I've been doing those for a number of years as well. Even if it's just a quick question about like, hey, would you all rather we focus on getting the background and such first, or are you really eager to get into the lab and actually be you know, doing things? Do you want the preparation? And this will tell me where to direct my attention and my time. That kind of information, again, is very useful when it comes to me deciding exactly how to direct my scarce time. But also the students can stop and think and recognize yeah, there is a limit to what can be done. It helps students understand a little bit more behind the curtain of what's going on on our end. And then from that point of view, from getting to see that transparency to an extent, they will stop and think about what are their priorities and together you can work to come up with what is most important, what is perhaps not as important. And yeah, when it comes to actually designing these questions, do keep in mind like the limitations. So when I think of um, some of my own best practices, I'm one of those people who uh, is not very good at keeping things simple. I love the basic questions that are included automatically on the OMET and they often elicit some great feedback. I like to add additional questions to get pointedly at something that I want to know about. For example, over the last, um, two years I've been looking to move to open education resources for my lab class. The lab manual hasn't been suiting our needs and so I've been surveying students mostly at the end of the semester, now I'll have the opportunity in the middle, to see like are you using these online resources, are you using the e-reserves at the library, etc. So I like to craft very directed questions. It is really easy to go overboard with that and add on all the questions that address everything you're curious about, like, you know, what your students might be thinking. And, well, for one, you don't always have to craft your own questions. There are a lot of great, easy to add questions that the OMET surveys already have that you can add on. But then if you do craft your own questions, you can get some really good pointed feedback. For example, um, this last semester, we have, for our main lab course in microbiology, an optional in-person component that is reliant on us de-densifying the labs, no more than six students, all wearing masks. The gloves and wiping things down were kind of already standard. But I was very concerned that, you know, how we're running it, are the students comfortable with that? And so I included specific questions like parentheses at the beginning, this only applies if you are coming in person, otherwise do like NA, and then it's like, how comfortable are you, or I am comfortable with, yada, yada, with the Likert scale, uh, agree to disagree. 
type scales. And I was very relieved to find that um, the precautions that we were taking, all of the students who responded, which was a couple dozen, felt comfortable with it. But uh, along those lines of crafting your own questions, a couple of tips, don't ask questions that, uh, well, not necessarily you don't wanna know the answer to, but if it's something that you can't change and you would be eliciting ideas for change that they then, students might think, you know, oh, maybe we can do it that way. If it's something that you can't change, be explicit about that. Like I solicit open-ended ideas, how can we improve um, this uh, in-person lab experience? And then, you know, side note, things like having an open lab time are not going to be feasible right now. Students really do respect that. And then the other uh, types of questions that are good to add just a few of are the ones that get students self-reflecting on their point in the class, what they can do to improve things. And I often get a lot of good insights from there like, oh, I could speak to my UTAs more about the content that I'm having questions about. And that prompted me to think, hmm, what is the barrier between my students speaking to their UTAs? It's actually a little bit difficult for them to find that information. So I made the UTA emails and contact information much more prominent and uh, accessible to students. So even just not direct things like that might result in something that you can take action on, but also anything that gets students to be self-reflective about their learning is gonna be beneficial and again, get them more invested and uh, engaged with the course. So I'm happy to answer various questions as well and uh, look forward to hearing your questions. Thanks, Kim. Uh, you know, you really are reminding us to be uh, intentional about the questions that we ask in a midterm, not only about, uh, you know, being explicit about things we really can't change, like the fundamental learning objectives or design of the course, but also things you're really curious about, a new teaching technique you're using or a new a new approach that you're applying. Uh, speaking of questions, I note that there are none yet um, in either the chat or the Q and A um, option on this platform. Since most of us, you know, in the Zoom environment are kind of more familiar with chat, I would suggest that you again enter your questions there. Uh, we have one more panelist, and then we will uh, turn to our um, our, our discussion and. And Sasha, and I'm delighted to see you. <laughs> we uh, we are very glad that you found a way to uh, join us. And um, uh, uh, Sasha Vilankar is a professor in the Department of Chemical and Petroleum Engineering in the Swanson School of Engineering. And he too has some uh, very, very interesting things to say about how he uses various types of assessments uh, throughout the course, um, uh, not only with respect to um, satisfaction with the course itself, but um, uh, there are students' understanding of key concepts and retention. So I'm very excited to hear what uh, Sachin has to say. Sachin? Thank you. <clears throat> so first, I have to thank uh, Ashley, who just called me on, on my cell phone to, to help me through the problems, the usual technical glitches, I suppose. but. But uh, I'm on, so that's good. And I was able to catch all of what uh, Kim said and about maybe a half of what, of what Dori said. So I'm sorry about that, Dori. Uh, so yes, I am in chemical engineering. I've been at Pitt uh, since about uh, 2002. And um, for the most part, I've been teaching classes that are fairly technical, uh, disciplinary classes in engineering. Um, like typical engineering classes, most of these are very quantitative. So very nearly all activities and in some kind of an equation or some kind of a number. And there really aren't very many opportunities uh, for the students to, to uh, express their opinions in free form in class, because this is not a discussion. These are not discussion based, based classes. So uh, it, you are never going to find a student who raises their hand and says, oh, the homework is too long or oh, God forbid the homework is too short. Nobody is ever going to say that. Um, 
So surveys are the only way to find out what are the students saying because they just are not going to speak up in class. And midterm surveys are absolutely wonderful. So I want to say amen to everything that that uh, Kim was saying and everything that I heard uh, Lori saying at least. Uh, and uh, in particular, Kim was saying questions about self-reflection, for example. I often get, I often ask this exactly similar question. What, what uh, I, I asked them obviously, what can the instructor do to improve your, your education? But then I also ask, what can you do uh, to improve your education? Invariably, the response is, I, I can start homework early. Uh, so, so to the extent that it helps them, uh, perhaps it does. I also want to sign on to everything that, uh, that Lori and Kim said. It's, it's, the, the end of the term surveys, the students take a, with a philosophy of pay it forward. They recognize that they are benefiting from what uh, previous generations of students uh, have given feedback on. The, <clears throat> the advantage of midterm surveys is it, it, it gives them a personal selfish motive to say that if I, if I make a suggestion right now, there's a real chance that I might personally benefit from it. And as long as we make that clear ahead of assigning the survey. Uh, it is it is uh, becomes that much more useful and much more uh, more likely to elicit a sincere, uh, serious response. Um, the big picture I want to say is that uh, I'm not just talking about OMET surveys. I mean, OMET has been doing midterm surveys. I'm not quite sure how long. I guess I have been doing it through OMET for about two years. But uh, just like Kim was saying, th there are other ways ad hoc uh, of of conducting surveys and in particular um, instead of google surveys i have been using uh, either a course web or canvas whatever is the platform that it itself has been using which makes it very easy to do and in fact in the core chemical engineering classes that that i have been teaching <clears throat> i often do these weekly um, at the end of the week there'll be a survey and uh, to avoid survey fatigue i suppose these are kept very short so typically three three maybe four questions um, every maybe once a month there might be a much longer survey, but um, the the uh, and the other aspect of it, I guess, is these platforms, including Google as well, make it possible to conduct the surveys using a phone. So so that uh, makes it more likely that the students will quickly take it. I have a colleague, for example, who every Friday uh, at the end of class uh, will let out a couple of minutes early and say to the students, "Hey, take the survey right now," and the students will do it right away. So it's it's convenient. And of course, they are anonymous. I'll say more about this in, in a couple of minutes. And so once, uh, because of all of these things, the ease of ease of access and anonymous and so on, the students really do speak up. Something, things that they would never say in class. They'll talk about my accent, that I speak too fast, or complain about the fact that the class starts at eight o'clock, or uh, things that I wouldn't recognize. Something like the students behind, uh, on the desk behind me are, are constantly disturbing me or uh, things like that that I would never learn otherwise. So you get a lot of responses. I have literally had students write out poetry in, my, in, in, in the responses. Um, not, all the, not all the responses are negative. Uh, one of the weekly questions I would ask is, what went well in the last week of what I was teaching? And that's always gratifying to, to, to see. Um, of course, there is also a companion question that says, what did not go well? Uh, that is less pleasant to to read, but more useful. And then the important part. The important part is we got to review the results in class, right? So line by line, I go through through the results. It takes a little bit of class time, but it's not too bad. It's well worth it. And whether this is a formal OMET survey, survey or one of these ad hoc surveys that I conduct, it gives the students confidence that they are being heard, that, that all the feedback they are giving is not going to a black hole. And... <clears throat> Uh, it's also useful to to highlight all the comments that come up again and again. So they they give con they get makes the students think that they are all in the same boat. They are, they are not the only ones uh, who are taking six hours to do the homework. All their classmates are are in the same boat, right? So uh, there is a little bit of uh, being in the same uh, uh, same same boat, I, I suppose. Um, and uh, and so th th these are many multiple reasons why th why these sort of surveys turn out to be very useful. I'm going to take about two more minutes uh, to to talk about something else as well, uh, which is <clears throat> which is not big picture surveys of the class or the instructor or the teaching assistant, but also in class evaluations that are much more narrower, much more targeted and focused. 
this i think of this a little bit like quality control right that you are doing something is it accomplishing what you are trying to do or not so 10 years back the standard way of doing this is at at the end of some particular segment there would be a concept question with multiple choices then you go around and there is a show of hands right who thinks a is the right answer b is the right answer and how the students don't even raise their hands like right? there are five options they never raise their hands and then a lot of them are sort of look around and they, they are a little bit uh, influenced by the peers and everything so then eventually the technology caught up and we started first getting these clickers and then this turning point software and now the current platform i guess is called top hat it doesn't matter very much which one you use the point is it's instantaneous it's anonymous it because all it involves is them pressing pressing a button on a device right and the results were eye opening and not necessarily in a pleasant way uh, there, there would be many situations where half the class would get these these questions wrong and it would be like we just went over this exact same thing and everybody in class nodded vigorously and i thought everybody had got it but until there was a chance for me to actually check it in a way that i could trust the response there was no easy way of really testing it so that's really what i mean by quality control and that that turns out to be very useful in and that really made a big difference to uh, both how i teach and what i teach ended up i ended up cutting out some of the uh, more obscure content in in favor of of stuff that the students really need to know uh, which they were actually not not getting so i want to close uh, close my little bit by saying that anonymity is really the key right students i guess some students are shy they are reticent they are afraid of um, that their opinion may not be heard if they express it in in class or worse they may be afraid that it will be heard and then they will become unpopular with the classmates because they suggested the exam to be moved to some other date or whatever it might be so for whatever reason they don't want to speak up in class and this is the best way of finding out uh, by polling them frequently if you don't ask you will never find out um so again i'm we are all happy uh, to take uh, questions uh, on any of this ashim thanks so very much um and you know i really found it fascinating that you include um, one of your questions, uh, a self-reflection for the students. What could they do differently in the remainder of the course or in the weeks ahead, uh, as well as uh, what you might do as the uh, instructor? Very, very interesting. So I still see no uh, questions, uh, unless I'm missing them, um, Brittany. And if I am, if I'm not looking in the right place, please let me know. But I don't see questions from our attendees yet, so uh, I'll sort of take the uh, uh, the coordinator's prerogative, if you don't mind, and 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 begin uh, with some questions, um, really for the entire group, um, and um, maybe one or two for individuals um, based on things you really emphasized. Um, so let me start with Kim for a moment. Kim, you you were really um, specific in saying focus on things uh, you actually can change uh, in the remainder of the course. And uh, I try to do that in mine as well. And some of the feedback I've gotten uh, has been fascinating. Uh, some of it is even behavioral. Um, uh, some students have said things like, um, um, oh, you seem to call on the same people over and over again, or um, um, we don't spend enough time on the case studies in the class. Uh, we we breeze through some of them too quickly. I, I use a lot of management cases um, in my classes. And uh, so those are some uh, things, of course, that I can I can change uh, as the semester goes on. I wonder, Kim, if you don't mind, if you wouldn't mind sharing, what, what are some of the students, um, what are some things that come to mind that have been most valuable to you in terms of a pedagogy or um, classroom management that you can actually change? Things that are related to classroom management that I can change. Well, for one, I've always had to work on slowing down my talking and then also just not talking as much, which, yeah, transitioning from teaching lecture classes to lab classes, they, they don't want to hear me talking. They'd rather be doing the hands-on things which actually on a side note flex at pit means that i now have pre-recorded almost everything that i need to say so we can move that outside of class and focus on lab things um i think 
some of the feedback that I, I've got on classroom management has been just like you said, making sure that everyone's participating. I do take a lot more care in, I actually physically walk around room. And at this point, as a result of uh, wanting to get all students involved, I actually involve or include in my opening day spiel, like, I want you to answer questions. I want you to answer correct questions incorrectly because I used to ask a lot of questions about class climate and I've gotten that to a good point now, but I used to have some students who would say like, you know, I don't feel comfortable raising my hand with like a wrong mm -hmm. answer. I explain on day one now that incorrect answers, like you're not the only one who doesn't understand something. And it's very important for me as kind of like a little mini formative assessment during class to know what's not being understood. So honestly, I'll take a wrong answer over a right answer. And then following that along the lines of students not participating as much or trying to get that equal participation, which is more difficult in person. I tell the students that if you're raising your hand and I'm not making eye contact with you and kind of ignoring it, please take it as a compliment because you've already participated and I want to get other people participating. So just in advance, know that that's not, you know, something uh, that you should be upset about. You're, you're doing well, but I want to include everybody. So yeah, I, I've uh, used a lot of the feedback about class climate as much as possible to then inform my approaches. Mm -hmm. um, Great. I don't know if there's any oh, other specific ideas or that others have. Well, Laura is asking a follow-up or a related question. It's it's on the same topic. She's asking, I'm wondering how, and I'll just address this to anyone who wishes to respond. How do you communicate to students about the things that you're not able to change in a given semester? What what what's that conversation like? Well, I'm a very candid person. Sometimes too much so, like letting them know a little too much about like you know how last minute i was in preparing for class i am generally just up front and that was a conversation i had this semester with my one class saying like yeah i know you don't like lab notebooks i totally agree i don't especially like them either and we can try to like i'll i'll take some of these things into consideration we'll reframe them but we can't get rid of them i'm sorry it just they're important because we need the record of the data. It's a skill that I want you to learn. So I'll try to accommodate in these ways, but uh, now it's too important to our learning objectives. Mm -hmm. If you can tie it back to the learning objectives and point out why something has to be the way it is, that often goes a long ways towards helping students be okay with it if it's, if it's something they really don't like or really would rather change. So making it obvious, making those connections obvious for them, because it's not always as obvious as it might be to us, is one way to have those conversations. That's great, thanks. Uh, Lori, I have a question for you. Um, I, I, again, I, I'm impressed by the fact that you actually code um, or cluster, you know, the feedback into certain themes, and then in the next class session or shortly thereafter, you actually feed back um, to the students what you heard. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you, excuse me, how you do that feedback? Is it is it a discussion with them or is it really just here's what I heard and here's what I'm going to try to do uh, in the remaining uh, weeks in the course? How do you do that? Sure, that's a great question. And I, I will say I have the wonderful advantage or opportunity. I teach qualitative methods. Um, I'm mm -hmm. teaching it this semester, and so it's a nice way to sort of model back a little bit of what we do um, in in terms of that. But I, I do share it back, um, you know, in, in terms of actually, it, and it sounded like Sachin does something very similar, in terms of presenting it to the class, like, here's what I read. Sometimes I will take, you know, sometimes they're beautiful direct quotes um, and talk about okay, this is what we're going to do, or this is what I heard when I read this, you know, correct me if that's not what you meant, um, or if that if other folks wanna ask about that. Um, and so I'll share out, and then we'll usually have a little bit of a discussion um, around whether, you know, about whether these things make sense, how they can be incorporated, and then to the point Kim made, then what 
can't be um, changed in the short term. And for us, I think the other aspect, because so many of the classes, um, all of the classes I teach focus on taking a critical perspective um, towards sort of dismantling systems that we find to be oppressive. Um, I'm a sociologist, so that's what I do. And so we also then talk about, okay, if this is something that I can't change and we can't change collectively in this short term, is it something that needs to be changed in the broader, you know, context of the School of Education or of the university or of higher education more broadly? And what does that mean? So we do also talk about like an important part, I think, for me and, you know, Sachin talked a lot about the anonymity of these assessments. And I think that also brings a critical part because not just allowing all students, but in particular allowing students who are first generation, students who are racially and ethnically minoritized, students mm -hmm. for whom English isn't their first language. I think this also gives them a space to say, hey, I might feel uncomfortable speaking up because yes. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. Or I don't want to say that, I mean, to Kim's point, because I might be wrong or my classmates might not agree with that or you instructor may not agree with that. And you're, you know, we, we also talk about the power dynamic and that's an important part. At the end of the day, I'm still the one who puts those grades into, you know, into the, into the, in the course management system. And although, again, we talk about what it is to be a community, that power dynamic is very real. And so we will also talk about that, right, as we, as we think about it. And so part of the, the feedback process is also modeling like, hey, yes, that power, exam, it, it, that power dynamic is always going to exist, but how are there ways that we can allow everybody to participate and what are the suggestions you have because you're, because you're living it? So, so we do, and again, um, it, it ends up being a little more um, presenting out in my larger courses, but if I'm 20 or under, we can have more of a group discussion. Um, about that and that and then that's how we we sort of incorporate it. That's terrific and I'm so glad Lori that you raised the issue of uh, tying it back into um, uh, our keynote actually today too on um, uh, diversity and inclusion the, the keynote happened to be on STEM courses and how to achieve a, a better type of pedagogy there but it applies in many other different contexts in Gispia for example as you just mentioned we have many students who come from other countries. English is not their first language. They may even come from a country where their educational culture is not one oriented toward discussion in the classroom, but where the professor is the so-called sage on the stage and, and it's primarily a lecture environment. Um, so I was going to ask, I've, I've gotten feedback from students in the midterm that has been enormously helpful. Um, saying things like I'm not comfortable speaking up in the large class, but I might be in a smaller group. So I began dividing some of our case study discussions into small teams and um, and then I rotate around and, 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 and meet with them and then we reconvene for kind of a reporting back session. And that's a, at least I found in some circumstances, that's a way that some of those students feel uh, more comfortable. Would anyone else like to talk about any feedback you've gotten that does relate to um, issues of diversity and, and inclusion in the classroom that has been helpful to you? I'm happy to share, but I don't wanna, especially you know, we, if Sasha wanted to share something. I, I, I don't think I've had a very much on, um, no, go ahead. Okay, sure. If, if either Sachin or Kim, if you want to jump in, please, please do. Um, so, I mean, that to me is sort of at the core of all of my teaching. So I try really hard um, to provide a lot of different modes of participation. Um, and that I've gotten usually gotten really positive feedback on. Um, so as you point out, Kevin, small groups, but then even another step, some folks feel very uncomfortable choosing their small groups. Particularly, I'm fortunate in one of my courses, we have students from all over the university. So they're not, you know, they don't know each other. And then there's always a, a subset that are all school of ed. So they do know each other, right? And, and it starts to feel like like a US high school where you're like, well, these folks all know each other. They sit together, those, those kinds of things. Um, Zoom has taken care of that beautifully because I can do random groupings and they don't have to, you know, decide who to sit by. Um, one of the things that we also do, uh, we start courses with, or I start my courses with what I call a do now. 
that I don't think of as being evaluative, but it's an opportunity for them to reflect on what we've read or what we've been talking about, and then they write down their response. And sometimes we just share the writing on um, our Canvas page. So you may not want to say it out loud, but you have a brilliant idea and you feel comfortable if I read it, right? Now that we're in Zoom, sometimes I'll say, how about we put it in the chat if you don't feel like saying it? And, and again, there may be myriad reasons. You know, it could be connected to feeling comfort, comfortable with the language because, especially now that we're home, you have young children in the space and they're, <laughs> you don't want everybody to hear them or you're still in your PJs, right? Like there are a lot of reasons. Um, we can imagine that folks folks are doing lots of different things. Um, the other thing, so if we're in the classroom setting, sometimes I will have posted um, uh, like large, essentially like large sticky notes, right? Like large, large note paper that folks can write down their responses and put those on stickies. And so again, I'm reading it out. You got to share it, but nobody has to know that that was you. And, you know, that that also is, I feel that if you start to build those different modes of participation into all of the class, then you're going to hit on one that everybody feels comfortable with. But again, we always have folks who do love to, sh to share and talk. Um, and so making sure that's that's the case, but also keeping it open um, for, for other folks. Um, I think that has been one of the, the biggest aspects of it. I would also say transparency for me from the onset. Um, we will we will talk about it in the first course, like in our first course meeting, to just talk about the different ways that folks feel comfortable. Um, and sometimes then folks will come up to me afterwards. But I, the other thing I found um, that you mentioned, Kevin, is sometimes from a cultural perspective, I am always the first to say, there are gonna be things you bring up and I don't know and we're going to learn it together and some students feel very very uncomfortable with that because that is not the experience that they've had um or we talk a lot about you know again i'm in a different space in social science but they're not being a right answer and there being multiple truths and how do we share and respect those and so we spend a lot of the first few classes talking about that and i think that that's that sort of sets the tone um, for being able to continue in in different activity patterns, but also just keeping that as part of our conversation. Great. Sasha, did, did you to want to add something on that? Uh, no, not, I wanted to echo, I wanted to add something just to, on a very narrow point, which is, um, I think this point came up earlier already. Um, it is very true that in most foreign countries, course evaluation isn't a thing, uh, or in general, Asking students for feedback uh, isn't a thing because it it's like w what have students got to do with their education, right? They, I mean, we are the ones who are pouring stuff into their minds or whatever, whatever the philosophy might be. But so the idea of conducting course evaluation at all is uh, for uh, certainly new newly arrived for students a uh, a new thing, and so the sooner we uh, the, the more we communicate that we want to hear from you, your opinions are very much valued, uh, is more useful. Certainly by the time they finish the first uh, uh, first year or so, they, they get used to the idea that yes, their feedback is going, to, is going to matter, but doing it early is very helpful. I can um, speak then a little bit back to what Lori was saying and stuff about like groups and uh, you were saying about having students form groups and then give their opinions. I found like the the traditional think pair share or just discussing something in a group almost always helps those who might not be willing to raise their hand or who were uncertain be confident about speaking up or at least getting their opinion integrated into their groups and someone else sharing it because they get to run it by a peer first mm -hmm. and so I've based a lot of uh, instead of just directly asking students for like a specific question, I try to do the group based activities and then have someone report out with um, the course design such I did this year where I was actually trying to figure out uh, one of my other labs how we were going to do it. I set up a system of having students actually go into breakout rooms in groups and I gave them a prompt or two like how did you uh, like this aspect of lab courses? What do you prioritize about the skills you want to learn? Had them discuss it together and then jigsawed the groups to discuss a point that was beyond that, that was more integrating it. But I got a lot of great ideas 
by doing an exercise like that. Not as many as I might have gotten if I let them go home and spend time thinking about it, but enabling them to run it by each other really uh, helped progress the ideas beyond just like the initial one. And they got to hear from each other and well, also they got to meet a lot of their classmates. The other thing that um, I do that's not quite a midterm assessment, but I have a uh, student survey at the beginning of every semester. And the questions mm -hmm. on it depend entirely on what the course is for some advanced level, what's your course background? But then I also want to know what are your responsibilities outside of class? What kinds of things like, do you have uh, anything that you, like a family member you need to take care of? And I always qualify it with anything you say to me is confidential and you don't have to be, but I'll try to take that into account when it comes to, um, I very, very intentionally design groups for my one course. And I've gotten a lot of good feedback on those, especially um, I've had at least one student undergoing uh, some transitions with uh, her, LG their, my apologies, LGBTQ identity. And they had some requests about the group structure and I formed a group for them that ended up being very supportive with some long lasting friendships and very, inclusive and worked out very well while still having the rest of the class all together be a cohesive and supportive unit. So asking those questions, finding out that information and trying to work it into whatever you're designing can be very useful. I, I want to uh, echo that as well. Uh, so, so conducting course surveys before the class starts, literally before the first day, um, is useful. I have been doing that for a while. Until recently, those, those questions used to be fairly narrow. Things like what is your comfort level on some of the previous prerequisite classes and stuff like that, so, and and uh, things like that. But certainly, COVID uh, under COVID, uh, the question bank expanded a great deal. What what kind of internet access do you have? Do you do you have a place to sit at home where you 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 will not be disturbed? Things like that started. Uh, I started asking. Um, by and large, things have worked out okay. Uh, but I I think I think asking questions ahead before even the class starts. Um, is useful. I'll probably do more of that in the future and certainly based upon what Kim was saying, um, it is certainly true that a good number of students do have uh, jobs and so on outside. Um, it's it's useful to know. It's not always one can do something about it, but it's useful to know that uh, ahead of time. So I'd probably, on, on my own, uh, for myself at least, uh, expand that a little bit even more. Going on. And I have to do something just real quick from uh, what Sachin said, going back to like the keynote address, having that insight really does help you round yeah. out your perspective of different people and give, you know, a much more multifaceted view of your students, which can then help like, I'll look back if I have a student that's struggling before I reach out to them, I'll look back at their info survey and see what do they have going on yeah. that might be part of all this. Absolutely. I just wanted to add one more part to that because I do surveys and now you you both have given me ideas for things I want to ask in those pre-surveys as well. Um, but one thing that I've, I've heard continuously from students, and it's a very simple question, um, especially now that we're in the Zoom world, um, is having them state their pronouns and then having folks use their pronouns in their Zoom space so that everyone can make sure they're not misidentifying or misgendering folks helps a tremendous you know, amount, but I also think it just sort of acknowledges students in a way that that I know is very much appreciated, right? So a lot of the information we're collecting, of course, is just for us. It is, you know, confidential if they're, or, or it is anonymous, um, but in terms of that, then then everybody can sort of participate again in, in sort of building that supportive community. Great. And I do want to just draw everyone's attention to a suggestion, not really a question from one of our attendees who says two questions I will ask on the midterm survey is, quote, what is one thing your instructor does that you would like her to continue doing, end quote, and two, quote, what is one thing your instructor does that you wish she wouldn't do? And um, Lisa finds that um, extremely uh, helpful uh, in this. And I, I, I think that does focus notion of, um, offer my own anecdote, if you will, to this notion of pre-questions in the first class or so. And I 
of course, always go over the syllabus and the learning objectives and and then ask if there are, you know, things that students are surprised by or wish they had seen or hope they had seen. And in a recent class, I teach a course in strategic planning. Um, and a student raised their hand and said, you know, um, planning has different connotations in different cultures. And um, even the notion of information and certainty about the future has different meanings. And having taught this course for many, many years, uh, frankly, it had not that that aspect of it had not really occurred to me. Now, again, there were limitations on what I could do in that particular semester. But I asked that student to provide some readings for us on that topic. And uh, she was able to actually make a short presentation later in the semester on her travels and how planning, if you will, as a construct is viewed in those different cultures. And it was fascinating and it'll be something that I'll do going forward, but never would have known had we not sort of asked each other in the very first class, what is it about this course that either surprises you or um, uh, is something that you weren't expecting? Now, again, I'm not seeing um, any other questions, but we do have four minutes um, remaining before we adjourn. I'm wondering um, if any of you um, or all of you would like to make uh, some closing comments, if you will. I didn't prep you on this. I hope I'm not surprising you, but just one of the perhaps um, greatest benefits to you of having done this um, or other advice you would give to our audience. Um, I don't want to put people on the spot. Uh, um, well, I actually wanted to follow up really briefly with uh, something you just said, and then maybe I can just use that as my closer. But um, that reminded me of a question that I asked at the end of the semester, though you could also ask in the middle, what do you wish you had known or had taken advantage of? Look at that data and then share that with your current students in advance of something and be like, yeah, a lot of students said they wish they had taken advantage of this resource at this time. So I'm mm -hmm. telling you before you're getting it that this is like, you know, important. So don't just take it from me, take it from the previous students as a way to encourage your students to actually say, use something that you worked really hard on, like a outline or something like that. So yeah, having the student Thank input you. on that can be useful. That's great, Kim. Lisa, uh, you had your hand up a moment ago. We'd love to hear from you on this as well. Thanks, yes, I just wanted to mention that um, I think I talked about the fact that you could add custom questions to your OMET midterm survey, and you can also do that to the OMET end of term. So regardless of how you're collecting this feedback throughout the term or midterm, whether you're using our process or you're using something else, you can kind of track how things ended up going. You know, if you did make changes based on the feedback, um, you can always follow up on that on your end of term survey to see how it actually turned out. And that might be really good to share with students in the future too. Fantastic. Anyone else want to offer some closing comments? Not a comment, but but I, I feel uh, I'm going to to I, I took the time immediately when you said this to pull up that old little poem that my student had written. It's anonymous, so I don't know who wrote it, but it is so nicely written that I, I feel uh, feel I should I should read it back. So that will be my closing comment. I'd ask the students to comment on their most recent exam that had four four questions, and this student he or she I don't know. Uh, wrote uh, four lines uh, addressing each one of these questions. So I'm going to read it back to you. Less derivation to ease my frustration. More, ca more calculation. That's my expectation. Third question. This wasn't fair and gave me a scare. Fourth question. Nothing rhymes with entropy. Well, I went back to the class and I said, uh, I read them back, read back to them and said, well, therapy rhymes with entropy. So that's how you handle thermo. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, we have, I think, uh, Laurie, anything you'd like to add at the end? I don't want to leave you out, but. That's amazing. I, I wish I got poems in my feedback. I, all I yeah. would say is just to reiterate, 
I, it's amazing how much transparency helps you build uh, a, a strong classroom community. And this is just one way to do it. It, it truly is. It, it, it truly is. Uh, all I can do is emphasize that and uh, reiterate what you've just said. Well, once again, everyone, I want to uh, thank Kim and Lori and Sasha for their um, expert and uh, really candid and honest and transparent uh, sharing of what you've achieved through this. Uh, Lisa, thanks for being with us and thanks very much for taking the initiative. I was personally very excited to see that um, the OMETs were uh, going to go in this direction. It's a relatively recent initiative and I'm sure that we'll learn as we go along, but uh, thank you very much for doing that. And Brittany and Lorna, thank you for being in the session as well and uh, providing uh, certainly some um, um, help for us and, and, and comfort and participation. So thank you very much, everyone. I hope you enjoy the, uh, the remainder of the conference. And um, again, um, best wishes to all of you.